motion applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Second. Thank you very much, Mr. Shutt. Mr. Castillo. Aye. Mr. Cheney. Yes. Ms. Highland. Yes. Ms. Carney. Yes. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Rasnick. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Thank you. All right. Very good. Let's uh, all join and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. The next item this evening is the adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, we've adopted our agenda. Um, tonight, the next thing we're going to do is have the second public hearing on the budget of our current budget season. Um, I think that these, budget, budget, yes, both of these slips that I have in front of me are for people who want to speak on the budget. Um, the first slip is Amanda Blanchard. Good evening. I see you all the time. <laughs> it's going to be worse before it's better. <laughs> couple of things. First, a couple of thank yous. Thank you very much, school board and Mr. Brett, for the continued updates, especially with graphics. We love a visual. Um, on the budget information and getting in the community, as well as staff. I've heard a lot of things from staff even today about how they really like the visual pictures that help represent what's happening related to this, the budget. Um, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for your email asking for input about the class side and its impact. It's best to hear that from staff because they're the ones who are there every day. Um, just a couple of things to remind the board of. Number one, a competitive salary with other school districts surrounding us is going to keep, retain, and attract highly qualified staff. If we don't continue to provide input, or not input, increases in our salary, we're going to lose people, plain and simple. Um, the second thing, we need to do the best that we can to make sure that we maintain a small class size. That's what we've built ourselves on. Right? We are a loving, small community. If we sacrifice one for the other or others in general, those two are very vital together, and I think together those will make us stronger and continue to give you the staff that we've come to enjoy in our school system. So, again, I wish you luck in the process, and I'm always here if you need me. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Just as a quick aside um, to Ms. Blanchard uh, being here, I wanted to let the um, community know that we have uh, arranged with the principal's dates for the school board to be in each of the school buildings, two buildings this Friday, two the following Friday, for any staff who'd like to to come and talk to us about the budget, ask questions, share their concerns, thoughts, and ideas. Um, so we will be out in the next uh, 10 days or so in all of the schools to hear directly from a, a broader variety of staff. All right, uh, next uh, we have Amy Ballard Wood wants to talk about the budget. I'm uh, Amy Ballard Wood, I'm at 514 South Spring Street in the city. And uh, actually I'm going to adjust what I was going to say a little bit based on Amanda's comments. Um, but I do want to just say a few brief words in support of our teachers because I think that they're the most valuable resource that our school system has. Uh, although I'd love to see Dr. Jones's proposal, uh, proposed budget adopted in full, I've been here long enough to know that we've got some tough choices ahead. Um, um, and as you set priorities, I hope that you'll consider the step increase untouchable. Uh, I'm sure that's the single most important thing that we do to keep and attract the high quality teachers that make our schools so great. Um, I also hope that you'll make any other decisions on the basis of their effect on teachers' morale and their ability to teach. And if keeping class sizes below a certain level is the best way to support the teachers, then please do everything you can to keep them. What I was going to go on to say was, if they have other priorities that they would put above class sizes, then please take those into consideration. <laughs> but clearly, <laughs> clearly they've uh, uh, 
class sizes on their top of their list as well. So that's all good. All right, thanks for coming. Very good. Is there anybody else who wants to speak during this hearing on the budget? Seeing none. Um, are there any other communications that you have about the budget, Mr. Uh, Campbell? Not about the budget, ma'am. Okay, so let's move on to public comments, the routine public comments we do each meeting. I don't see any of those either, but I see here in a notation about a letter. Mr. Kimball? Yes, uh, Ms. Uh, Stephanie Oppenheimer uh, 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 is writing to thank the City Council, the School Board, and a number of others uh, for um, seeing through the ordinance to place uh, cameras on our school buses. And she writes to say that she is grateful for all of, of your efforts in making the streets safe for our youngest citizens. All right, thank you very much. And I'm going to take a a, a moment to recognize Mr. Sharp's leadership on that topic. He uh, picked it up and ran with it, and uh, without him, we wouldn't have been successful. So I, I want uh, everyone in the community to recognize his outstanding leadership on that particular topic. And, and thank you, Mr. Sharp. Um, the next thing is uh, recognitions and reports. Um, this evening, we have one recognition. Um, the month of February is a time that we recognize the clerk of the school board for all the hard work that the clerk does to keep us organized, keep us moving along and moving ahead and make us a successful school board. And so, uh, Mr. Kimball, I'd, I'd like to present you with this certificate. And, and thanks from the board. I, I'm not sure that everyone in the community understands the many, 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 many hours that the clerk puts in to support this school board. This clerk in particular, um, nights, weekends, and so on. And I'm going to pause for a moment. If there are members of the school board who'd want to say a couple words about our clerk, um, we can kind of diverge from our usual here and hear some of those comments. Anybody? Mr. Cheney. Um, back from my first meeting, but I remember back in 2004, the only way you survived on the school board was to get to know Hunter, uh, because he was always the holder of all the key information, and uh, he st obviously still is, and I remember a point where he was thinking of leaving, and he stayed, and uh, I think the board and the city have been incredibly grateful ever since for that decision and your continued service, and the fact that you've taken on a lot more duties over those years, so uh, thank you so much, and good to see you again. Great. Thanks very much. Mr. Razzle. Hunter, we can't thank you enough. Uh, I, if there is a more earnest, hardworking uh, employee, not only in the schools but in the city, I'd like for somebody to show them to me. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hyland. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Kimball, you uh, do such hard work for all of us, but your good humor is much appreciated. So thank you so much for that as well. <laughs> Great. Anyone down this in want to make some comments? All right, we'll start with you, Mr. Lawrence, and then we'll come back up this way. Um, Hunter, I first met you back in the uh, the daycare days, and uh, I rapidly found out that if I had any question, you would answer. And, you know, I found at least at the same time, but in, in terms of numbers, you were always on top. And I think what really hit me was today when we were down talking before, and, and Tony actually had to make a point of saying you hadn't worked this Sunday because not working on Sunday afternoon is odd for you. So, thank you. <laughs> we sometimes describe some of our students who have been here from kindergarten through 12th grade as lifers. <laughs> <laughs> Hunter is the ultimate lifer. Yes. Having been here through, through his uh, school days and then coming back to us as an employee as a leader in our finances, and even as a piano player for our commemorative activities, which I under understand he'll be doing for us tomorrow evening. Oh, great. So thank you for a lifetime of, of good work. Yeah, I'd just like to commend Mr. Kimball for his, his uh, good humor and earnestness, but also for his, uh, I think, his commitment to being reality-based when it comes to numbers, whether they be financial or enrollment. I think he's got a commitment not to what we think is the case, but what is the case. I think that's extraordinarily valuable. 
and I, I think he serves us all well by calling the things the way he sees them, and, and that is a rare commodity and one to be greatly prized, so thank you. Very good. I'm just going to close by saying a couple things. First, many people may not realize this, but in addition to putting up with the vagaries of keeping this board organized, uh, Hunter is our chief financial officer and our chief operations officer. He oversees much of our school division very successfully, as we all know. And the second thing is just kind of anecdotally um, to talk about his commitment. We had a budget work session on Saturday, which meant Hunter was up early and over to central office with the rest of us for three and a half, four hours of hard work on the budget, it was, and he cheerfully participated in that. Um, Tony says he didn't work on Sunday. Um, however, I did see Hunter on Sunday um, at the Dogwood with a big smile on his face and, um, and, and, a, and a big hug to say, boy, that was a great budget meeting yesterday. We are so charged up, this is going to be a great year. And my husband, after he walked off, looked at me and said, I wish my employees were that way. <laughs> it was just, you know, it was just so Hunter. So thank you very much, Hunter. It's a pleasure to recognize your contributions and your friendship. All right, that was fun. Um, moving on to the next item, which is the consent Ms. Carney, agenda. May, may I just make one 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 comment, and and, and that is, um, as you know, the either the position I hold as clerk, um, I'm appointed annually, unlike you who are elected for for four year terms. Well, most of you are anyway. Some Charlotte, I know you're you're in there for a little shorter term. Uh, so every year. Um, I make, have, have made a pilgrimage, and sometimes the mountain has come to Muhammad, and the, and the clerk of the court in Arlington has come to, come to the central office, but I take the oath of office. But I do remember well when um, David Bell was the clerk of the Arlington court, and I went there with, with Marty Goodell uh, to get sworn in and we, as, as the deputy clerk, and we both took our oaths of office and signed our statements and everything and got them notarized. And um, as I signed them, Mr. Bell took them and he turned to Ms. Goodell and he gave them to her and he goes to the person who really does the work. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you something, I have a great partner here. Yes. Here, here. Thank you for that. All right. So the consent agenda is next. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'm Chair, I move that the board approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you very much. Is Would you like me to read it? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh, you need to read it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're just clipping along here so we can okay. see the president's speech. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> very good. Um, I'll make it quick. Uh, appointments <laughs> that the board approve the following staff appointments for the remainder of the 2012-2013 school year. Jennifer Reed, first grade professional, Mount Daniel. Marguerite Flanagan, special education inclusion paraprofessional, Thomas Jefferson. Celia Meia de Romero, food service worker, Mary Ellen Henderson. And Susan Kane, third grade teacher, Thomas Jefferson. A retirement that the school board accept the retirement of Mr. Robert Nissen, Building Services Supervisor, system wide effective May 31st, 2013, and a non reappointment that the board approve the non reappointment of Stephen Papalian, science teacher George Mason, effective the end of the 2012 2013 school year due to reconfiguration and reduction in course needed. Thank you. Now we can proceed to a motion. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move that the board approve the consent agenda as presented. All right, thank you, Mr. Rasnick. Is there a second to that motion? Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And are there any opposed or abstentions? No. All right, thank you very much. We've adopted the, approved the consent agenda this evening. Moving on to business action information, the first item is the approval of the 2013 2014 school calendar. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tony Jones to brief us about that topic. Our uh, division-wide calendar committee met and actually came up with two different calendars. And to be honest, this year, I mean, it's almost like every year when you can't start before Labor Day, you, you know, there are certain things that you're locked into. The biggest difference between this calendar and the other calendar that, that the committee came up with um, was having the day off before Thanksgiving. Some people wanted that, some people didn't. Um, coming back on January 2nd and 3rd or not coming back on the 2nd and 3rd as instructional days. 
If we had um, voted to come back on the second and third, then it would have shortened the school year by a few days. But our, this is actually an unusual year, and uh, Tom Horn helped us a little bit because of the athletics calendar and the way that it actually falls at the end of the school year. Um, so what we did, we took the two calendars, and then we send those out to all of the, you know, to the committee, but then we also send it to the whole division, and everybody votes. And this year, it was right around 85% all wanted the same calendar, which is amazing. That's really, really high. Um, so everyone's very pleased with the calendar overall. And it was nice to see this year. Last year, we were split by buildings. The calendar was, because we had the election day and some unusual things. And last year, early childhood really wanted one calendar and high school wanted another, and so we had people that were kind of a little cranky, didn't quite go the way they wanted. This year, all the buildings were balanced, so that was great to see, and um, very supportive of this calendar. All right, uh, does anyone have questions for the superintendent about the proposed calendar? Ms. Hyland. Why is graduation to be determined? Right now, because what this calendar does, and it was gonna, it, it would do it, um, it didn't matter whether or not we were moving, um, those two days in January or not. It just it falls later. And our typical graduation is the 11th, and uh, would be like on the 11th. And so right now the high school, they don't even have this calendar out yet where we can actually get the date booked. And so she's calling right now and she's waiting. But the high school would like to look at that 16th, 17th, 18th date because we haven't quite figured out if kids graduate on the 11th, highly unlikely that seniors are going to come back to school for the remainder of the school year. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but we are very, yes. <laughs> that we're accountable to have them there. And so we'd like to be able to have graduation on a day that really works with this calendar. Um, but again, the high school staff's working on booking that right now. Okay. You're All welcome. Right. Any other questions for the superintendent or anything down here? I hear whispers, but I'm not. No? Thank you. Don't make me reprimand you down on that end. Um, all right, is there a motion, please, to approve the calendar? Um, I'll move that we approve the calendar as presented for 2013-2014. Thank you, Mr. Cheney. Is there a second to that motion? Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed or abstentions? No. All right, thanks very much. We have approved the calendar for the 2013-2014 school year. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, a new one for us. This is the approval of a student liaison to the school board. Um, this is a new thing we're doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Lawrence. And if you would uh, give just a little bit of an overview for the community about the board's intent in adding this liaison, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. Well, the, the idea for this came actually from a, a student in our schools who saw that other jurisdictions did it and really wanted to know what the school board thought of it. And, and she came to both Mr. Brasnick and I and, you know, we, we raised it here and, and what I really liked was the fact that everybody either said it's a great idea or said we, we've talked about it before and we've wanted to do it and we just haven't done it. So, you know, we, we did our research and we found out that other jurisdictions did have it. We talked to people down at the VSBA conference back in, I think, November, maybe October. And um, so we decided to, to do it. And, and we set up a, a process so there wasn't a free for all. The superintendent and the, uh, the principal of the high school had to come up with a, uh, a list of names that they sent to the, the Student Government Association. And then it was up to the, the, the SCA or the SGA to actually choose who they wanted to be the student representative. And, and the representative is not just for the high school, it's mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the students as a whole. And I'm, I'm very happy that the, uh, the Student Government Association has made a decision. They actually made it today. And I'm, I'm even happier at the, the person they chose because she's someone I've known for a very long time. So um, I don't know if you want discussion now or start with a motion. Whatever if you you'd like to make a motion, that would be terrific. OK, Madam Chair. I move that the school board approve the appointment of Maeve Constance Curtin as the student representative to the school board for a term ending June 30th, 2014. And I second. Thank you. Um, are there any questions or discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? 
No, there aren't. All right. Congratulations, Ms. Curtin, on being our first student liaison. I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind coming up to the podium and just introduce yourself to the board. And then you may join Ms. High here uh, at the table for the balance of our meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Maeve Curtin. I'm a junior at George Mason High School. I wanted to thank you all for approving this position. Um, I think it is very needed, and I'm very excited to serve in this capacity and looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, and welcome. We're so pleased yeah. to have you join the team. <laughs> And now that you've been appointed, the superintendent and her staff will make sure that you get an orientation and begin to get the materials and so on so that you can be prepared for the meetings. I know everyone who sits up here will volunteer themselves as a resource for you if you have questions, issues, concerns, just want to understand something that's going on. Don't hesitate by uh, knocking on my door since I know you live down the street from me, calling someone, emailing someone. We're all really here to um, help you get acclimated and be an, an important part. So, Great. Uh, the next item this evening is a construction update from the superintendent. Well, we are just clipping along. If you haven't driven past TJ again, it's, it changes every day. Um, they've done two levels, I think it was two levels. I was standing at the stairwell watching. It was kind of creepy, I think, for the workers because they're at that level now where it's like you're standing right at the end of the hall staring at them. But um, <laughs> I like to watch the work developing. So, and it really looks like a building. And mm -hmm. when you stand in the hall, it's really, it's fascinating. So we're really excited over there. We have actually had the trial flip of the switch with the lights, which was very exciting for some people to make sure that they actually would come on and then you know they're doing all of the testing so that's um, going fantastic we're also Sevi is working incredibly hard on on the fence aspect I think you know how much work has to go into that and how many meetings um, with Fairfax Fire Marshal we met with uh, Virginia Tech and UVA yesterday because they're next door um, they have to bring in all of the big wigs from other places in order to sit around the table with us and we also have the Virginia Tech Fire Marshal they offered his service to come and walk the property and again because we always share the boundary so um, lots of, of exciting stuff moving forward there today we actually had a marquee up front and some people saw it because when they when they showed up to do the demo they already had you know the Mason logo and everything on it but that's an aspect that the seniors have really worked on over the last couple of years and um, this year we feel like the funding will be there so that when the fence goes in aesthetically to also have a marquee coming in, an electronic one, which the high schools wanted for a very long time, um, they're, we're moving in that direction as well. So it's going to be really nice, I think, when it's all done. So just letting you know. I did I did try to talk them into just leaving the truck there until the end of the year, and they, they would not do that. But, um, <laughs> but construction is going great. So thank you. All right. That's great. That's great. Anybody have any questions about that? Um, I, I'll echo Dr. Jones. Drive by. It's amazing what's going on at TJ. It's, it's so exciting. Yes? May I just ask one question of Dr. Jones? Th there have been some reports on, on blogs or other sites suggesting the fence was a, a hasty knee-jerk mm -hmm. reaction to uh, events such as the shooting at Newtown. I don't know if you would care to sure. respond a little bit and, and maybe clarify. Um, you know, after Newtown, we, we did a safety audit and in really looking at everything, you know, we're looking at cameras, are our door locks the way that we want them, is the glass in the right, I mean, it's everything. And the fence is an item that we've talked about internally for a very, very long time because Mason is just, first of all, I mean, if you think about where it's located just by Route 7, Haycock and the Metro, uh, on any given day, there are at least 100 people that are walking across the campus. and. Sadly enough, not all of those people are of sound mind. They're not, um, it, it's a safety issue for us. And so, you know, I think one of the questions people have have maybe tied the fence to that it would prohibit something like what happened at Sandy Hook has nothing to do with, you know, active shooter. This is a different, it's about defining the perimeter. Uh, we've been working with the police. They also think it's going to be a huge help for us to keep people off of the property. Um, I will say right now, because I had somebody ask me this today, we haven't even issued a PO. There's so much 
work that goes into this. Um, and then when, when Mr. Padilla gets ready to actually um, move forward with a contract, we actually, which we often do in school divisions, uh, we have state level contracts that we can ride with other school divisions so that you don't have to go out and bid. You can actually, there's, it's already been done. And so we're able to do that with the fence, which is the way we'll move forward. Um, but right now we're just trying to get the design where it hooks in and there's just a lot of work that has to, to, has to take place before a fence will go up. So we're working on it right now diligently. All right, thank you very much. Anyone uh, else have a comment or question? Yes, yeah, Mr. so, so Madam Chair, can I ask you, or uh, I'd like to ask the superintendent. One, uh, Dr. Jones, was there any was there any uh, contract let for the uh, security assessment at the school? No, uh, all of our assessments so far have all been gratis. We work with security company, fire marshals. Today we had a whole different company out who's talking about access control and helping us assess our entrances and exits. So, you know, right now, luckily, there are so many organizations willing to work with schools that uh, we're getting a lot of consultant help. Okay. Secondly, would it make no charge. would it make any sense um, to release the results of those assessments uh, to the public? Uh, beings that I would assume they're sensitive in nature and uh, that it may be something that would be better kept uh, in the purview of the superintendent's office. Could you kind of talk about that a little bit? We're very careful about safety and security because if we do have a weakness somewhere in a building that we want to work on and we need to fix, the last thing we want to do is advertise that. And so we're even very careful about how we perform our drills, you know, and, and that's what we're advised to do and have been for many years. Um, it, staff know that all of our safety and security is something we try to keep internal because the more you would advertise, what you do is inviting people to understand your process and your procedures, and that's not wise. Okay. Have you received any requests for information from the press or the public on this particular issue? Um, no, I think we had a Q&A early on that we did ourselves, but other than that, no. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, have, have you had any discussion with the police department or the chief of police regarding uh, the validity of establishing this sort of perimeter? Well, we've been coordinating with them. I mean, and, as a matter of fact, we have a meeting again tomorrow uh, with, the, with Chief Gavin, but very much so they've walked our perimeter. We're all, in, I mean, we're all on the same page. Has, has the Chief Police said, oh, this fence is a bad idea, let's not do this? No, as a matter of fact, I mean, the input's been great from the Police Department. We have great coordination. And, you know, where we've probably had more discussion is do you have a gate that moves or do you just leave it open because once you define the perimeter and, um, so, no, we're all on the same page. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, very good. Yeah, Chair, can I just ask one last question? How long has this fence been contemplated? You know, if you talk to Mr. Padilla, he he would have a voice that's talked about it forever. I don't know. He's been here for six years, maybe, seven? Um, because it's a huge, it, it, it is a big issue, something we really are, con are concerned about. And we talked extensively about it last year. And... Um, you know, it has budgetary, obviously, implications, and um, and we thought this year that's why we put it in the CIP. And then, as you remember, we, as a school board, decided that it was important enough to move forward. But it's it's been a concern for a long time. Yeah, Ms. Carney, I can go back to 2004 when Mary Ellen Henderson was approved, and it was contemplated as part of the capital improvements there, and just as part of it, and it was decided not to put it in. But it was certainly talked about as part of a security perimeter at that point, and that was a long time ago. Thank you for that, Mr. Cheney. Anything else? All right, thanks very much for that, Dr. Jones. Um, but you may as well keep being sharp because the next topic is a technology update from you. Okay. One thing that the school board has asked for is a technology update on when we actually had our outage. Um, and we had a huge meeting last week, probably two or three hours, just to really, we wanted to have the whole team together, and so we had to wait a week or so just to get the team together. Um, the first thing that I would say is there's really nothing we could have done as a school division um, to not have happened what happened because it was an issue with Dell and it was between Dell and VMware but it really was a Dell issue and you know I think whenever technology goes down there are a couple of 
things that people will ask. First of all, most people think it's a server issue, just because that's what most people know. But um, it wasn't actually an issue with our server. Um, the second aspect, the two questions I probably get asked the most, and, and I know there's even, there was even a letter to the editor in the paper where it talked about, why don't you have backup? Well, there are two, really two different features. One is backup and one is redundancy. When we're talking about backup, we're talking about lose, loss of data and you know being concerned that, well, we have no concerns whatsoever. We go out in six different directions and that was never a concern for our tech team about backup. Um, we have an extremely, extremely powerful back end. So um, when we talk about redundancy, that's the piece I think that a lot of people have assumed should have kicked in. And redundancy is when your server goes down and then it goes out in a different direction and it keeps, keeps you going. But if the issue is not a server and the server is fine and there's no indication that anything is wrong with your mechanical side, redundancy is not going to kick in because it wasn't a server issue. And that's the part I think publicly a lot of people don't understand because if, if a server had gone down, we have, actually I think it is six different directions, that's why we never go down. You know, and I, I've really tried to, I think, be encouraging to say we have, our tech team's been here, two of them between 15, 20 years and they've never had, they've never gone down like this. Um, so when it happened, one of the most difficult things was trying to figure out why, uh, you know, where was the problem? Because usually if it's a server, you've got red lights flashing and all kinds of things. Um, so they actually, it took, I don't even, I would say 15 hours, 12 or 15 hours just getting through Dell and through VMware to a high enough technical level because you have to start with the low level tech and then they keep passing you on. And uh, we, they reached a point really late on, I think it was the Friday night um, after they'd already been down for a long time and, um, and Dell was insistent that we needed to take down a server, which was actually our exchange server. And we're saying that that was the issue. So um, the techs did, they, they were telling them, look, it's, there's no indication it's a server issue. They went ahead and took it offline. When they did that, it looked for about two minutes. <laughs> like, oh, maybe, it'll, well, no, it didn't work. And at that point, Dell realized it was something else. It was not a server issue. So, and, and I will add too, that we always call in. We're not, um, I guess, cocky, so to speak, to think we're supposed to know it all. So we do work with a lot of contracted health. Um, and Teledyne was there, who's a contracted company that we share with the city in collaboration. And they sent out their technician that same night um, that does a lot of work for the Department of Defense, was brilliant. He actually, about midnight, said, I'm sorry, but you're wasting your money. Uh, I need to go home um, because this is a Dell issue, uh, which was kind of discouraging actually because you hope these people are going to come in and fix the problem for you. Um, we also have Cisco who we do contracted work with and as we've moved this year for uh, BYO, bring your own device, they're the ones that have helped really set up difficult and high level networking. They were calling and checking on us as well. Um, and then we also had Jamal from the city who, who came in and helped us um, just because we also had the, our, one of our senior level techs who was overseas and was remoting in. So, um, so as they went through the night, and they what it was a problem with when you do upgrades, you get them all the time. Like if you, uh, for us, some, with something like PowerSchool, you have 5.01, 5.02, 5.03, and you probably see that even on your home computers often. You don't do every little single upgrade all the time because sometimes when you upgrade, it throws something else off. Well, what, we just happened to have the perfect storm where VMware had an upgrade and Dell had an upgrade and they're partners uh, for virtual. And there's only really two big companies that, that school divisions use where within their script, and it's much higher level than I once it gets to four screens and all those numbers running up and down, but um, they had to go in and really find within that script where the problem was. And so it took them until about Saturday morning when they were able to decipher that, and it was a, an issue with Dell. And they've acknowledged that, and last week we did issue a, a letter to Dell and ask for an apology because we think it would be, they've, done, they've already apologized on the phone to us, and we do have the name of every, you know, our technicians were great to, mark, to take down the name of every technician who worked uh, with us through the process, but we're still hopeful that they're going to do the right thing and issue an apology letter just so publicly people will know that this was a Dell issue. So that is, um, that's the extent of it. And again, I, I commend our techs. They worked literally night and day and uh, it's the first really even 24 hours I would say was it's so difficult when you're trying to problem solve and you have no idea what the problem is and you're calling in the best and brightest in the country to work on your system and they can't figure it out either. So, you know, I, I commend them for their tenacity and staying with it. I know it's hard on the students and they were very patient. That's it. Got it. Okay, very good. Any questions? Any questions, Mr. Castillo? 
Yeah, I, I would just say uh, three things. Um, the, the first of all is in, in, in the IT world, they talk about having one throat to choke. And uh, we need to know <laughs> whose throat to choke here. I don't know whether it's a Dell throat or a VMware throat, but somebody needs to have accountability so we can choke them. Um, uh -huh. the, the second thing is whoever's throat needs choking, they need to know, and this is common in the IT world, that you don't do critical updates to infrastructure around, you know, the, the retail industry doesn't touch their infrastructure the quarter before the Christmas shopping season. And similarly, why Dell and VMware in the education market would think about doing something like this before exams is, is, is a question I would like to have answered. And that's the, the, the final question is, what, if anything, do we need to do differently so that in the unlikely event this happens in the future, we will have a, a continuity program to ensure that we can continue operations unimpeded by um, this, this kind of problem, I think is, is absolutely critical. So um, I, I look forward to hearing the answers to those, those questions. Thanks. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Dr. Jones, thank you for that. Um, and, you know, since we are in, in the budget time period, you know, if there are things that need to go in our budget to make sure that, that we're in, in um, the best shape we can be in, you know, I think the board would support making sure that happens. So, all right, the next item um, on the agenda is a discussion of the fund balance policy. By way of introduction, uh, I would tell the community that um, this past summer there was a lot of discussion in our city, as there has been for almost since I got on the board about the fund balance the school board has, where it comes from, how and when it's used and not used. And um, at the end of all of that, um, I told the superintendent that I thought for transparency and clarity that it was important that the school board adopt a policy about our fund balance, where it comes from, how big it can be, and how we uh, manage it so that everyone in the community has visibility into that. So I um, want to thank the superintendent and Mr. Kimball and um, Tom Horn, I'm sure, for helping us to come up with what is tonight a draft fund balance policy. Um, this is the first discussion the board will have about it. We aren't going to approve it tonight, but we are going to discuss it and give some direction to the superintendent. So with that, I will turn it over to the superintendent to step us through what they've put together, and I'll then call for questions and comments from my colleagues. Well, one thing that we've, we've aimed for in the fund balance policy is trying to keep it simplistic because when we looked at policies around the country, some policies will be half a page and some will be 10 pages. And it's so driven by, for instance, like with our city charter, which is different. Um, with this fund balance policy, what it's really doing is at the end of the year, it's really trying to change, I think, more vocabulary oriented. And I know somebody suggested calling it a fund balance um, contingency policy as in the title, because at the end of the year, if we have those savings that they would actually help fund a contingency the following year, which we struggle every year. As you know, this year we had 150000 in contingency and it was gone. I don't know if it's gone before the first day, but it was fast. Um, and, and what is in the superintendent's recommended budget this year is 250000 which is still, um, given the growth that we have, not a huge contingency to come in and hire teachers. Um, you know, 150000 is one teacher pretty much in a para. So 250 is two teachers and two paras. That's kindergarten and first grade. And if you think about Mount Daniel, where you have 9.5% growth this year, that very well could be the case again. Um, with this policy, what it does is um, it actually allows us um, not to exceed 2% of uh, the subsequent year's budget. And if you're looking at this policy and how it would apply today, Hunter, help me, it's around 700, 750? $700,000. So it would give us a healthy contingency. And um, we still have some questions. I have some questions into John Foster, and I'm sure that you'll have more questions for me um, on this policy, just because we're working with city charter um, and knowing how that would look at the end of the year. All right. But that's where the 2% number comes from. Okay. All right. I'm going to start on my right-hand side. Mr. Lawrence, do you have any questions or feedback? Um, just two things. One is we're not trying to say we need to have a 2% fund balance. This is just if there's excess. Not to exceed. We're trying to, we were trying to stay out of um, kind of the, that whole not issue that we had last summer where people thought it was too large and 2% right. keeps it at that very reasonable level. And that also was going out and doing our homework and research and looking at what divisions um, are doing. 
Okay, but the idea is that this would make us spend down to no more than 2%. Okay, I've got one head nod. Um, to, to my knowledge, and I don't have the draft in front of me, but w what, what is implied is that uh, given any fund balance that remains at the end of the year, uh, any amount up, up to 2% of, of, the, of the operating budget w would be earmarked as contingency that could be accessed to f f higher teachers, staff, by buses. If there were any funds above that, if it, you know, if there were 100,000, 200,000, if it were 3 percent, any funds above that then would be designated f uh, for other purposes, including, I believe, like capital it's items, and it's down, down, at, down at the bottom of the draft policy. But the idea is that we're, we're saying we want to make sure that we keep it, we get it down to two by spending mm -hmm. it on certain things. Right, and we actually, I'll tell you the policy that probably was the most helpful there because they are the most similar to us is Arlington. And this is what this number has the, down on the bottom where it says FCCPS capital projects and uh, the immediate one-time needs of non-recurring nature. Um, that language is really what they use in Arlington. That's very helpful. And their policy is a little bit different. Obviously, they're set up differently, but um, their policy was very helpful. So that you're actually, what we've done with our fund balance right now, buying buses. You know, if we were over that 2%, we could take care of some of those pressing needs. And, and Mr. Lawrence, uh, that, that's a very good question, and I, I can g give you an example that I believe was three years ago. I believe it was in the spring of 2010 or 2011, I'm not sure which year it was. The General Assembly that year um, gave all school divisions, actually all municipalities in the state, a holiday from pe making their VRS payments in the final quarter of that fiscal year. It was completely unexpected, completely unanticipated. The result of, of that meant, that, in, which in the short term was a very good thing, it meant that the Falls Church School Board did not have to send down to Richmond to VRS between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars and $600,000. That being said, what happened is that five hundred, that six hundred thousand dollars, then became unexpended funds at the end of the year that we were anticipating spending, and then rolled forward in, in, into the fund balance. Um, under under such a policy as this, you know, as soon as we became, we would become aware that you know, that, that a significant expenditure would not be made and there would be excess funds, at that point. Theoretically, one could see that okay, so you know, two two percent of the of the budget, we're, we you know we're getting earmarked for contingency, which would leave X hundred thousand dollars, which could then be targeted towards you know very very specific items. Um, <coughs> I guess it's the longer way of saying, you know, that every year um, we you know we. We spend what we need to spend in order to uh, you know, provide the, the educational program. Um, it just so happens that the year we're in right now is very, very tight. The needs are, are, are tight. As you can see the board just appointed more, more staff tonight in mid 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 year. Um, there may be other years where where it may not be um, so tight, but but that in terms of having a a, a prescriptive a prescription or a mandate to spend down to you know to a certain point and just spend for the sake of spending. I don't believe that that's the intent of this policy, Dr. Jones. Did do you? Um, to try to spend down. Yeah, to just you, the intent of the policy really is just to make sure that um, that that two percent goes into contingency, and then we could fund those things with the remainder. Like for instance, the tennis courts that's been in the CIP for the last two years. It would give you the flexibility to be able to say we can take care of that. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of snow and ice this year, and we've saved X amount of dollars, and um, we can actually fund the tennis courts right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sharp, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, as I understand, the, the charter calls on us to return uh, certain funds if they're unexpended. And I think we ought to try to articulate in this policy uh, when we would have such funds. Uh, we, we've, we've articulated the contingency, and I, I, I see that, and I see that we might, uh, having money above the contingency, uh, we could then potentially uh, uh, do certain one-time expenditures 
but I think I think we also need to to uh, articulate when it's appropriate get when um, it's appropriate to return funds to the city uh, there are also instances where and, and these these I don't foresee in the very near future for sure <laughs> uh, when we may have um, sort of on the on the downside of a um, of a cycle we might see instances where we have a decline in enrollment that we didn't expect or just not as as large an increase as we had, ex had expected and money that we were uh, obtaining from the state on a per student basis might be more than uh, what we're legitimately uh, entitled to and we uh, I don't, I'd like to have an understanding at least of what happens in those cases whether there's a you know potentially a credit is allowed to us <laughs> by the state toward like next year or whether we're obligated to return some funds to the state and, you know, I just like to see uh, if, if it, even if it's not articulated explicitly in this policy what what would happen in those in those instances um, I could respond to the, both of those questions now. It, 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 okay. uh, in terms of the state, when the state um, prov provides this money, they do provide us money, as you, as you mentioned, on a, on a per pupil basis. Um, they look at student counts at a number of times throughout the year. Uh, September 30th is a, is, a, um, is, is a number that we send down the, the, the enrollment as of se on a September 30th, uh, just as, sort of as a benchmarking to kind of get them a feel about what kind of numbers they're looking at. They don't really do anything with that September 30th number. Um, what the state does is they do provide school divisions funding uh, beginning in the new year based on our projected enrollments. Um, they, by September the 30th, they have an idea about whether whether those projections are high, are they low, just about where they stay, you know, they, they fit in. Um, March the th March the 30th is or March 31st is the uh, official date that we provide account for our number of students, our average daily membership. As of that date, it's the average daily membership for the preceding seven months, and uh, at that point, the state will make adjustments to the amount of money that they send us. They will either. Uh, send us less money if the enrollments are below what was projected or if the, the enrollments are, are actually higher than projected. The state payments for average day, the uh, per basic aid will at that point increase for the months of April, May, and June. So um, the state is very, is very cognizant of where it adjusts for the actual number of, of students. Um, so, I mean, and the good news is um, we don't, you know we don't you know lose lose money but we don't we don't get extra money um, either um, a colleague of mine several years ago in, in Fairfax noted that um, if the state appropriates a certain amount of money for basic aid you know say based on um, like a million and a half students and the um, and the actual count comes in at like a million Four, so there's a hundred thousand fewer students. They they still pay the same amount of money per student that was calculated. Basically, the state realizes the savings of paying out basic aid on a hundred thousand students. Conversely, if the number comes in at one million eight hundred thousand students, three hundred thousand students higher, what the state does is takes the pot of the funds available and then prorates it. And reduces the amount, right. um, which so so that basically they don't stand to make any loss, but they get to keep a gain if if in fact the enrollment comes in lower. Um, and there were, there was at one point some some um, effort to sort of make make that or even playing field. Uh, in terms of the language in the charter, uh, the city charter. Uh, directs the school board, as I think the board well knows, that any funds uh, remaining un unexpended at the end of the fiscal year, it directs the board not to return them to the city, but to use those funds to support the upcoming year's budget. Now that being said, there were two years in a row, FY9 and 10, I believe, that the board actually took a vote and did send money back 
and it was, it was, it was over $750,000 between the two years that the board did in fact return up to the city, but that was not prescribed by the charter. It was uh, of the uh, volition of the, of the board. Well, um, I, I think it's, again, those, those two things, uh, it would be good to have a have background uh, indicating uh, what are the circumstances that we uh, potentially could return money to the city, what are the circumstances that might uh, arise where state return would be appropriate. Uh, as, as you've articulated, what happens uh, with the state, it seems like that comes so late in the year that uh, the, the amounts uh, are probably de minimis and, and would, not, would not have a significant impact. Uh, there's also the instance that you mentioned earlier of the state declaring a holiday on VRS uh, unexpectedly. And I think uh, we also ought to, in this background, have some understanding of what, what we intend to do in, in that case in the future, uh, particularly if we anticipate that there is going to be a required increase in VRS payment uh, in the next year or very, very soon thereafter, and whether uh, we should have a, an option to retain uh, those in a reserve fund, which, which is not you know, one, of the, one of the items that we have at the, the end of this policy right now. Or, uh, just, just what it is we should seek to do at, uh, in that instance. Thank you. All right, Mr. Castillo, do you have any questions? Um, yes, Mr. Kim, I just had a question. In terms of the, the relationship then between the fund balance under this proposal and, and amounts for contingencies, basically the fund balance would fuel a, a, a larger budget for contingencies. Is that is that right? With, Essentially, that is that is correct. Let's say, let's say we have a million and a half as a fund balance yes. now, and two hundred and fifty for contingencies. Okay. What would happen under the proposal? The way I envision it, and 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 again, this is theoretical. Yeah. So, so just just understand that this I I've thought it through, and I may not be correct. Okay, is that given given the the draft policy before you, that for the upcoming budget, you say that policy were in place right now, that we would place in that budget a a two percent contingency in a line item that basically would that, sh you know, should something happen, should there be a VRS holiday, should more sales tax revenue come in, <coughs> because at this point we don't believe that there, that 2% that number is going to be there, but it would at least provide the placeholder and the leeway for the board to utilize those funds if they are available. So, so say for next year there would be $700,000 under the, under the contingency line. If the, um, if the fund balance is not, uh, does not reach that the, the $700,000 mark, we just need to be cognizant of that and make sure that we don't dip into that budgeted $750,000 fund balance below the, amount, below the funds that are actually available to utilize. Um, if we hit it right on the 700,000 mark, everything's great, and then we, the board has the flexibility then to target those wherever it sees fit. If, in fact, the number is above the 2%, the, the, the at that point, I would imagine that the board would have a work session or a number of work sessions and um, discuss you know, possibilities of how to best utilize those funds, target them, put them into a reserve, return them to the city, uh, move them to the capital fund, um, you know, th th those sorts of things. That, that, that's the way I would see it operationalized. It's All right, and, and under, the, um, under this revised proposal as contemplated, would, would any city council approval be required for expenditures under this new contingency fund? For, for the 2%, the city council approval would come as part of the budget approval pro adoption process in the spring. That the 2% would be in the school board's 
proposal and its request, and if, if the council approves, approves the, the, the request, then the 2% is part of that, then it's in the school board's budget, it's there, it's a line item, and it's, and it's there for, to, to be accessed by, by the board. The only, the, again, the only caveat is if we do not have um, adequate fund balance at the end of the year to cover that, we just need to be very prudent in make, making sure that we only spend the money that we have available. And, and finally, at the yes. end of the year, would, would there be any sort of uh, you know, fiscal year U.S. government problem where we have 200000 left in this fund? Would, would there be an incentive to go ahead and spend it on something rather than return it to the general treasury? Or um, Essentially, what would happen is that the fund balance, it, basically what it is is it's revenue that has come in in previous years that the board is then saying we're going to access this and utilize it and carry it forward. If, in fact, it is not utilized, um, at that point, um, a number of, of, of things could uh, take place. Um, one, depending on the activity in, in the fiscal year that we're talking, in, in the most recent fiscal year, um, you would either um, add to or maybe subtract from that amount of fund balance that, you know, that carried forward. Um, everything else being equal, it would then be part of the amount of money that the board would discuss during budget time about moving forward into the next year. Um, they would, we would calculate what 2% of the budget would be. We would figure out what that is. We would say, okay, we have the, you know, this fund balance that we, or we have this contingency that we know we're not going to spend, so we know we're gonna have you know, $200,000 that, that will be part of carry forward, that will help fund part of the fund balance, or we know that we will have more than 2%, and at which point, again, the board can discuss the disposition of those funds and targeting them. Yeah, I, I guess I would say only that in, in light of some of the recent discussions with the city council about some of these supplemental expenditures, I think they've largely adopted what we've characterized the fund balance as it is, how it works and what it is. This seems not you know, imprudent, but it'll basically yield a sort of one-time mini-dividend, at which time then it'll go to a, a more steady state. Um, so, so thank you very much. All right, thanks. Bill this in. <coughs> Mr. Cheney, any questions? No questions, just I think my attitude is let's keep it simple. Um, we'll ask for what we need and we'll spend prudently after that and, and then the fund balance will kind of take care of itself and, and that's what we've always done and, and that's, if we do that then, then we'll be fine. Some years you'll have more than that, some years you'll have less. Um, I would just advocate keeping the policy as simple as, as possible and, and allowing us to make the right decisions given you know, what we see upcoming. So. Thank you. Mr. Raznick? Yeah, so um, just a couple of, one kind of question, one kind of comment. Um, has the city manager or the CFO seen uh, this fund balance policy and have they provided any comments? We actually just talked about it uh, really for the first time this morning because we've been working on getting it to the point that you're ready for it. Um, so they, know, they knew it was actually, it's something they would like for us to do and we have been in, in discussions with them, so. So because it's very important to me um, that we clarify with the city their position in regards to this. and. And uh, Mr. Casillo alluded to it, but um, it seems like we've been in a situation where we've been criticized for carrying a fund balance and criticized for spending out of the fund balance. Um, so I'd like to know what their position is on the fund balance. Um, it's been my uh, belief that the fund balance is a good way of budgeting. It's a prudent way to budget with a carry forward, and I think that the city thought that was the case other than over the summer with this tech issue. Um, so I think it would be a really good idea to get what the city's position is on fund balance. Not that it will dictate what we decide to do as a policy, uh, but I think that it would make some sense to understand what they believe is prudent in terms of our direction for budgeting. Um, because to be quite frank, I, I am lost now as to which way they <laughs> think is the best way for us to deal with fund balance. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Um, I don't really have anything more to add except that I agree um, it's important to keep this simple because I think there's a lot of confusion about what is contingency versus fund balance and if we treat it in a much more, you know, easy to understand way, then I think it'll help us with our budgeting and then we won't have to answer a lot of questions about it. So I, I do, you know, applaud this. All right, I don't have much to add to that except um, I, I agree with, with Mr. Cheney. Let's just keep it simple. The intention here is to clarify, not to confuse and get complex. This board's always done what I think is responsible with the fund balance. I just want the community to know what to expect from us. And for boards over time to have some consistency in terms of understanding about it, I think that's important. Um, I do have a question, which is lines 11 through 14. I'm not sure why those are there. Um, I mean, I think the board generally recognizes its responsibility to ensure that resources are used properly and reported in accordance with law. So I'm not sure why it's stated in this particular policy, um, since that's kind of what our job is to do. So I don't know if we want to leave that in there or pull that paragraph out, but I'll leave that to staff to discuss as you take all this in and come back to us with a revised version. Um, I'll let the community also know, I, I think Dr. just mentioned John Foster, who's the city attorney and also an attorney on some topics to this board. We've asked him to make sure that whatever we're putting in place is uh, coherent with the city charter to make sure that we're all, all good there. So um, if there's nothing else on that topic, then we'll expect staff to bring back to us some revisions for discussion and perhaps first reading sometime in the near future. And uh, once again, I want to thank Dr. Jones and Mr. Kimball and also uh, Mr. Horn for your efforts. I know you did a lot of research, uh, looking at a lot of different policies from a lot of different places to make sure there was something that was really appropriate for our city and our, our purposes, so that's great. Um, moving right along next is the superintendent's report, so I will turn that back to Dr. Jones. We do have um, a very exciting event tomorrow, so I just want to point that out. We love our schools, and that's going to be at MEH. We hope everybody will be there, and Mr. Kimball will be uh, entertaining us at the beginning, I think, playing the piano. Um, but it's really fun when you look at the guest list. It's not a huge, huge group of people, but it's just really a fun group. Um, it is. Uh, you know, I had a meeting with uh, Dr. Pace just a couple of weeks ago, so I'm excited to see him again. He's so delightful. And there's just a lot of people that have really had um, so much of an influence, I think, on the schools in Falls Church City that will be there tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. And also, this is School Board of... Oh, we love our schools. It's also to celebrate Mason's 60th year. Thank you for that. And the weird thing is, I know it's not at Mason and we're celebrating Mason, but it's at MEH. And that's because, number one, we wanted Mr. Kimball to play the piano. There was no piano at GM um, as part of entertainment. But also just the setting up in the MEH cafeteria is... Um, is a better venue for us. Um, we just didn't know how many people to, to expect, and um, but it's going to be a great night. And since we're really talking a lot about GM construction, you know, it's great timing. A lot of our old, uh, the pictures of the school division, you can see all sorts of pictures tomorrow night of, you know, going back in history. There's a great uh, little video clip that shows some historical pictures as well, so it's going to be a great night. Um, also, the other big thing is we are celebrating our school board this month, and so you'll notice there are lovely cards that GM art students have provided for you. The posters down front um, are from Mount Daniel and TJ. And Miss High is making her way because at uh, middle school, you know, we love middle school. They put together a video because they're loving Yay. all their new tech stuff. Uh, but they're, they're, they want to say thank you to the school board.
<laughs> and all of the school sites, though, do want to, and the principals and leadership team, and our, on behalf of our students, just express our sincere thanks for all of the work um, that the school board does on behalf of our school division. It's not a job where you make a tremendous amount of money, I don't think, um, and you do an awful lot of work. And without a great board, we would not have a great school division. And the decisions that you make and the support that you give our staff, um, all of us, is so appreciative because it's it's a very, very hard job. And some of you have heard me say this. I grew up with my dad being on the school board. He was president of the board. And I remember how often our telephone rang for sometimes very small things. Um, sometimes they're huge things. But it's, it's a busy, busy job. And um, we thank you for all that you do. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Jones. All right, moving on to uh, board comments this evening. Mr. Cheney, I'll start on that end with you. Well, I thank, by, thank you uh, for appointing me to the board. Uh, it's my first meeting back, um, and it's good to be here. Um, I think the only thing I would add is uh, I haven't done too many uh, meetings yet, but I'm sure I will get into it. Um, we did have the Athletic Boosters uh, meeting uh, last night. Uh, Charlotte was there. Um, I remain as president, and again, thank you for that till the end of the year. Um, we are very close to bringing you the uh, check for the remaining funds for the lights, which are working. Uh, they have been tested and are uh, ready to be turned on and uh, we'll be making a presentation. There's a number of individuals that I want to make sure get thanked um, for their involvement and leadership in this. Um, and hopefully we'll have a couple of other announcements to make uh, around that shortly. So I'm, I'm targeting our next meeting at maybe the first meeting of March. But uh, when, the, when the bill comes due, we will have the funds for you for the remaining amount. Great. Mr. Resnick. So uh, I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about um, the budget proposal. I know we're going to have a lot to talk about, but I just wanted to make one thing kind of clear because I've seen in a couple of places criticism of the superintendent's request. Um, I just want to make sure that people understand that over the fiscal year 2007 to 2014 time frame, we have seen a 25% increase in student enrollment. Um, and when I came on this board, I sat down with you, Madam Chairman, and you talked to me about some of the keys to what makes our city schools great. Uh, and one of the things that you really uh, explained to me that was important was this idea of small classrooms. And I think that we are really in danger of, of jeopardizing our ability to keep our classrooms small. If you look at the data we see from 2007 compared to today, we are growing. Uh, and we may be sort of at that point where I don't know that we are gonna be able to sort of with a straight face for too much longer say we still have small classrooms in Falls Church City. So while we have seen that tremendous, I'll call it explosion in enrollment, 25%, uh, uh, over that same time frame, adjusted for inflation, the city's spending per pupil is down 18%. And that is a recipe for performance disaster. And so I'll just say that initial criticism that our uh, superintendent's request uh, was outlandish, I just don't think that the simple math adds up in that regard. Uh, I was struck by uh, the, some people asked President Clinton recently how he had a budget surplus during his time in office. And his response was, <laughs> I thought kind of funny, he said it was arithmetic. <laughs> Simple arithmetic. Mm -hmm. So as we prepare for this budget debate, all I implore my fellow board members in the community to do is do their math. Because to be quite frank with you, the numbers are there. And I think that they're really disturbing right now. And we need to do something about it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. So, thank you. Um, well, I can't say anything about the boosters meeting. No. <laughs> I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cheney. <laughs> no, you did. That's all right. 
Um, oh, yes, I did also okay. attend the um, PTSA meeting at George Mason last week, and it was a very, the, the entire meeting was the, the program that was um, for that evening. This man named Stephen Wright, who's a um, consultant, came in and talked about the interview process. Um, mainly for college interviews, but also just job interviews. And it was open to, obviously, parents and students. And I counted while I was there at least 20 students, which was really impressive. Um, and he, I have the PowerPoint presentation, the copy of it in front of me. It, it was, it's like nine pages. It's not a lot of stuff. It's, you know, do's and don'ts, um, how you should prepare, list of questions that you will most likely be asked. He spent over an hour going over these nine pages. So it was a really, really engaging presentation. I hope that the students got a lot out of it. As a parent, I found it, you know, very interesting. So um, I, I applaud the PTSA once again for doing some great programs this year. Um, just a program note, their next meeting is uh, March 6th, and in lieu of the regular meeting, it's the annual international dinner that evening at um, the George Mason Mustang Cafe. Starts at 6.30. You're encouraged to bring an international dish. There's lots of entertainment. It's really a great event, and I would encourage fellow board members and the public to all attend. Thank you. All right, very good. Mr. Castillo? Well, I have three words from my spies and uh, at the schools in, in MEH: um, goldfish and stuffed shells. Um, so, <laughs> my uh, uh, w one of my kids was reporting very favorably about some of the improvements that they're seeing in the food service, and, and oh. I think it's being received with with great appreciation <laughs> and gratitude. I, I was remiss in our last meeting to talk about I, I attended the Gifted and Talent Advisory Committee. Um, back in January, and, and there's a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm there, a lot of uh, good things going on. Um, I look forward to meeting again with them soon. And uh, I, I guess the only other thing that I would say is that uh, I, I've been extremely impressed at, at all levels with just the, the level of support with, you know, for, for recommendations for various summer programs. I think it's, it's astonishing how much time uh, teachers at, at all the schools are willing to devote to things over and above what already is on their plate to help uh, kids with, with additional activities and endeavors, uh, be it TJ or summer camp. So uh, I have to say we, we uh, are very fortunate to have the, the kind of staff and, and faculty and administrators that we have. And, uh, I think we, we sometimes are a little spoiled, so it's good, mm -hmm. it's good to remind ourselves of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Sharp? Uh, last night I was at the Partnership for Youth meetings, Fairfax Partnership for Youth, which is a um, regional nonprofit that uh, combines Falls Church and Fairfax County. They've been uh, engaged, uh, particularly the staff there has been engaged in uh, anti-bullying activities. They held a conference uh, right at the end of January, which was very well attended by counselors and PTA leaders and, and others uh, uh, to learn strategies for preventing and, and remedying bullying activities. Um, the, the group has had uh, some very difficult budget times. Uh, back in 2007, uh, they had a budget uh, of a little over $200,000. Uh, this year, they have a budget less than 100000 So their, uh, <laughs> their, their budget woes have, have been uh, perhaps even more strenuous than, uh, than ours and, and some others. Uh, but they're, they're uh, continuing to provide some good service for the community. They have some good things on the horizon, including, uh, uh, well, they, every, every month they have a mentoring training uh, program, and uh, in February, the, uh, the mentor training will occur on February the 20th. Uh, they will have also uh, on February the 12th, just, uh, uh, which was, uh, which is tonight. <laughs> they have a youth-led peaceful conflict resolution meeting, which, uh, in, is involved mainly with uh, schools in Fairfax County. Uh, 
uh, but they also remind, remind me that uh, February is Youth Leadership Month, National Youth Leadership Month, and we're very fortunate that we've, uh, uh, at, at this long last, recognized that we have uh, student leadership that should be present and uh, giving us feedback for our, our board discussions uh, on a much more regular basis, and thank you. Thank you for stepping forward to do that. Um, lastly, I'll just say uh, uh, I'm also a liaison for the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I think the Chamber has some particular challenges facing them uh, at this time. You may have noticed that the, the assessments for commercial property, um, they are the lowest uh, performing, if you will, category among our assessment uh, uh, categories. In, in terms of the increase that they've experienced in the value of their properties. They also face some unique challenges uh, uh, in the requirements that will be, uh, I think, uh, adopted for uh, providing for stormwater expenses, stormwater management, because the, uh, the policy that uh, the council appears to be heading toward is one that, that would uh, impose a a higher level of, of uh, obligation on properties that have uh, hard surface uh, that uh, causes uh, runoff. Uh, they'll also ha have the opportunity to mitigate that, that uh, to a greater extent than others with measures they might want to take. But, but um, there's, there is, a, uh, I think, a heavier burden that businesses will bear because of their unique kinds of properties uh, uh, from that from that new obligation that the city is going to be undertaking. And then we have our own uh, uh, expenses that we're going to try to be, try to cover. And I, I agree with Mr. Rasnick that we have um, a lot of catching up to do. And, and we ought to get going on <laughs> making a, a, good, a good measure of that catch up. We may not be able to get it all done this year um, because uh, there are there has been such a heavy deficit over these past past several years, but uh, we ought to make a long stride toward uh, toward getting uh, our schools back on track with small classes and uh, adequate pay for our teachers. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Mr. Lawrence. Two quick things. First, again, a warm welcome to Maeve, and I look forward to the next year and a half with her. Um, one, one boost for the, uh, for the band boosters, uh, before you come to the uh, We Love Our Schools tomorrow at 7, uh, from 4 to 9, there's a fundraiser at Flippin' Pizza. You need to download a flyer at uh, Falls Church City Band Boosters Weebly com W-E-E-B-L-Y, and 50% um, of the proceeds will go to the band boosters, and this is for the trip to New York to Lincoln Center. So. Uh, Please go there, get pizza, and then come over and, and get some dessert and listen to Hunter play the piano for us. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, I wanted to say just a couple things this evening. Um, first, to our new colleague, Ms. Curtin. Um, in future board meetings, we'll ask you to make comments at this time as well. I don't want to put you on the spot tonight if you're not prepared to do that. But if you are, I'll call for that in, in a minute. Um, um, you'll also join us in our work sessions as a, an equal colleague, and we're just looking excited to forward to that. Um, I want to congratulate our National Merit finalists. I have to admit to a bit of bragging each year at this time about our National Merit finalists. And people who know me for a number of years are kind of tired of it, but every year they say, I can't believe a small school system like yours has that many kids who are both semi-finalist and finalist. And I think that's a testament to our teachers and the rest of our staff to this board, to the community and the parents, and, and, and the way we do things here in Falls Church. That's just our way, and we see the success of it every day, every week, every month, every year. Um, and that reminds me of um, something that um, David Shavern said very soon after I joined the board. I think it was the first year when we had our meeting to kick off the budget with our city council colleagues. He was on city council at that time. And he had an observation, which was that the citizens who live in the city of Falls Church are willing to pay a lot of money for excellent schools, but not a lot of money for mediocre schools. And to Mr. Rasnick's point, I think we are teetering on an edge where our school's uh, excellence is um, in jeopardy because our classes are too large 
and we have a lot more kids coming and we don't necessarily have all the things we need to educate them. So I just want to go on record, I'm a, I'm a fan of David Shaverns. I think he had the right approach and I think the City of Falls Church believes that as well. Um, I am looking forward to We Heart Our Schools tomorrow night. This is a great uh, opportunity to see former superintendents, former school board members, former city council members to get together and talk about what it was like in the old days and what it's like today and to recognize George Mason. And I want to thank the staff for coordinating that opportunity for those folks to get together. I think it'll be um, terrific. Um, I want to welcome Craig back to the school board. We're just uh, pleased as we could be to have you here and uh, look forward to working with you um, over the next uh, what is it, six months before this interim term ends. And if you would please make sure this school board knows when you're going to have the ceremony to turn the lights on. The baseball field, I think we all want to go and attend that. April 2nd is the first home game under the lights and we're planning a, a soiree that evening. So assuming the weather's good, that's the only thing you can't control. Uh, April yeah. 2nd will be the, the uh, event. Okay, great. And I also want to thank you for your role in that. It's just a tremendous thing that you and the rest of the boosters have done for, for our kids and for the city. It's just awesome. Um, I want to just um, congratulate Bob Nissen on his retirement. He's just been such a great asset to our school system for so many years, and he's just a nice man to boot. Um, and, and he's a continual learner, as you might expect to find in the schools, you know, and he's moving out to be with his family and to contribute out there to a school in the special ed um, area, and I think that's just absolutely awesome, and we'll miss him. And I'm sure we're going to have an opportunity to tell him all this to his face sometime, but I just wanted to recognize that. Finally, for budget watchers, um, the next event for the budget is on Tuesday the 26th of this month where we'll be having a public hearing and a budget work session at central office. So please feel free to come and watch the website for new materials and information that the superintendent is pulling together as we go through our, our um, budget time this year. Ms. Curtin, did you want to make some comments this evening? Um, okay, so uh, I thank you again for um, approving me and everything. I'm looking very much forward to working with you all. Um, just a couple things uh, from my side. I would like to agree with you all that uh, small class size and teacher salaries are very important to the students. Just today in my theory of knowledge class, we were discussing um, those things as per Dr. Jones' request. Um, and we had some very interesting conversations about the effect of class size on student learning in addition to technology, which I know we were discussing earlier. Um, so those are definitely things that I would love to share with you and just the results. And I've had um, certain members on the SCA, I've asked them to ask their class their friends and in their classes, if at all possible, um, to discuss that so we can figure out what how students feel. And I know that the sentiment is it is very important to us. Um, at the high school right now, we have Challenge Day going on. That was today and yesterday, um, which is very important bonding for the junior class. Um, and I'm very excited to participate in that tomorrow. Um, and then just Ms. Highland's comment about the PTA meeting. I'm glad you enjoyed that and the student turnout. Um, <laughs> I would, I was very impressed with that as well. I'm glad that all the juniors responded to my request that they show up and hopefully we can continue to have that sort of student involvement in the PTSA. You know, that's something Mrs. Mother, Mother's Head and Mrs. Ehrman both really want. So I think that's all I really have <laughs> for tonight. All right. Thanks so very much. All right. The, uh, last thing on the agenda is the approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve. The first are from January 8, 2, 3, 6. I move that the board approve the minutes of the January 8, 2013 meeting. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Sorry, could I just suggest one change? We'll just let me get a second and then we'll okay. see. You second? All right. Uh, any questions or discussion? It sounds like you have a question. Well, not a question. It's just on pay, well, when I printed it out, on page four, it's the discussion of the Seek, Peak, and Eek recommendations. It's just under um, 5.04. Can you just spell out what Eek stands for since the others were spelled out? That's all. All right. Thank you. All in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. And now the minutes of January 17. I move that the board approve the minutes of the January 17th, 2013 meeting. 
Thank you very much. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I will abstain from that. All right. Uh, there are no materials for review this evening. Uh, is there any other discussion or anything else we need to talk about? If not, we stand adjourned for the evening. Thank you, everyone. Oh, good. Yay, what was the score? Uh, oh. <laughs> so this is the